Okay, let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. As you can see on the screen behind me, today will be part 2 of what will be a three-part series where Jesus talks about the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. And today we're going to be studying in chapter 5, just verse 22. But why don't we read our entire text, starting in verse 21, and let's go down to verse 26. We read the words of our Lord. You've heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you're presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you're with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and then the judge to the officer and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you've paid up the last cent. This is God's holy, authoritative, inspired, and yes, hard-hitting and convicting truth. And all of God's people said, Amen. Okay. Well, again, last week we started a new section. Uh, this section that starts in verse 21 and goes down to verse 48, where we see Jesus giving six illustrations, six examples of what he meant back in verse 20, when he said, I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus said, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. For example, number one, when it comes to this idea of murder, the sixth commandment, which is found in Exodus 20, verse 13, and Deuteronomy 5, verse 17. And if you recall, last week we saw, verse 21, how Jesus declared the command. And we also saw uh, what God says about murder. Not accidental killing, but murder, homicide. We learned last week that it was written in the Old Testament that murder, somebody who takes the life in a selfish, sinful unlawful way takes the life of another person? What did God say? Blood for blood. Death penalty. And so we saw last week this idea of what God means by you shall not commit murder. And if you recall, we also talked about how the religious leaders, the Pharisees and scribes, had really obscured God's Old Testament truth. They added their oral traditions, which they made equal, and in some cases even above, God's Old Testament truth. And we saw last week how Jesus declared the command, you shall not murder. Today, in verse 22, we are going to see how Jesus clarifies that command. That murder is not simply the outward act with your hands, but in God's eyes, 
Murder is the inward attitude of the heart. And then next week, verses 23 through 26, we are going to see <laughs> why Jesus commands all murderers <laughs> to immediately reconcile with those um, who they keep murdering in their hearts. Now, I know that doesn't apply to any of you. You've never done that. But just humor me as we go through this sermon today, all right? So, Today, again, Jesus is going to clarify the command. And, and like I said, the key here is to understand that Jesus is launching off of verse 20. Again, remember the scribes and Pharisees. They were considered the religious elite. And people looked at them and said, wow, look how holy they are. Look how godly they are. Look how righteous they are. Well, Jesus said to the crowd as he was preaching the Sermon of the Sermon of the Mount, he says, no, 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 no. Don't be so enamored by them because, Jesus said in verse 20, unless your righteousness surpasses, far exceeds their righteousness, which, by the way, was only external, while internally Jesus said they were filled with dead man's bones. You see, the scribes and Pharisees figured, hey, listen, if we, if, we, we don't commit, if we don't disobey God's command externally, it doesn't matter what we're doing internally. And Jesus said, you guys are hypocrites. And therefore, he said to the crowd, look, you, you want to get to heaven? You, you want to be accepted by God? Well, Jesus said, you want to try to do it yourself? Which, by the way, is impossible. She says, your righteousness has to far exceed theirs because they're not getting to heaven. Can you imagine the shock of that statement in that crowd? The Pharisees and the scribes are going, wait a second, did he just say we're not getting into heaven? Look at all we do externally. And can you imagine the rest of the crowd going, did Jesus say they're not getting to heaven with all they're doing externally? Exactly. And here, in verses 21 through 48, Jesus gives six examples of what it looks like that we have to far exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees to be able to be accepted by God. Which, by the way, let me just let you know what the end of the story is. <laughs> okay, go to verse 48. After Jesus gives the six examples, look what he says in verse 48. Therefore, when it comes to murder, when it comes to adultery, when it comes to uh, uh, divorce, when it comes to oaths and vows, when it comes to retribution, when it comes to love, including love for enemies, Jesus says it's real simple. Here's how far your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus said, what's the standard if you want to try to earn your own Righteousness and acceptance by God. Jesus says, um, just be perfect like your heavenly Father is perfect. <laughs> Can anybody do that? No. So we cannot, the scribes and Pharisees aren't accepted by God because of their hypocritical external righteousness. Jesus says, your righteousness has to far exceed theirs. How far does it have to exceed? I don't know. Just be perfect. <laughs> or there is a third option, which is the best option. Repenting of your sins, trusting in Jesus Christ alone, His grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, where His perfect righteousness is credited to your account so that when God looks at you, He sees the righteousness of Christ credited to your account and He says there is now no condemnation in Michaela because she's in Christ Jesus. To me, that sounds like the best option. Would you guys agree? Well, back to verse 21. The first example Jesus gives about righteousness, far exceeding that of the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus says in verse 21, you have heard that the ancients were told. Remember last week we learned that Greek word, were told, adethe, 
we're told by God in the Old Testament? No. Erefe refers to oral tradition. That came from the mouth, not of God, but the mouth of man. Remember we learned another Greek word last week, gagraptai, that Jesus used three times. Remember when Satan tried to tempt him? And Jesus every time would say gagraptai. It stands written and he would quote Old Testament scripture. So here in verse 21, when Jesus said, you have heard that the ancients were told, not told by God in the Old Testament, but told by man through oral tradition. Make sense? Again, as I brought up last week, uh, an example of a um, uh, uh-huh. uh You're not allowed to eat meat on Fridays. Where's that written in the Bible? It's not. It's not gagraptai. It doesn't stand written. Well, where did that come from? Arethe. You were told. Oral traditions. Do you see it? So here, in verse 21, when Jesus declares the command, and then he shows how the Pharisees and scribes twisted it, you, were, you have heard that the ancients were told, arete, oral tradition, you shall not commit murder. Is that in the Old Testament? Does that stand written, yes or no? Yeah. Again, Exodus 20, verse 13, Deuteronomy 5, verse 17. So that was, so what the Pharisees and scribes were telling the people, you shall not commit murder. That part was good. They were quoting the Old Testament. But watch this. You have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Is that? The biblical standard? Not quite. A murderer is liable to whom? A human judge? No. To God. And God has already stated the sentence, the punishment for a murderer. Death penalty. Remember we saw that last week? Genesis 9, again, we're not talking about an accidental killing, nor are we talking about soldiers in the military defending the defenseless. We're talking about a person who selfishly, sinfully wants to get rid of somebody else. You know, somebody else who has been made in the image of God. Well, God said very clearly in the Old Testament, He who sheds the blood of man, his blood will be shed. Death penalty. Of course, that person has to be proven guilty of murder. Witnesses, clear evidence. But once it's been determined that that person has committed murder, is that person liable to the decision of a human judge? No. Gagraptai, it already stands written in Scripture. That person's liable to God because that person has taken the life of another person who's been made in the image of God. That person who has committed that murder is not only saying, I don't value you as a human. That person who committed that murder is also saying, God, I don't value you or that person you made in your image. And unfortunately, we see people doing that all the time, don't we? Including doing that to unborn babies in mother's wombs. And as we saw last week, if society would simply follow gagraptai, that which stands written. Imagine this, a person who's about to commit murder or about to have an abortion, which is murder, That person would probably think twice if that person knew, oh, if I do this and if I get caught, no, I don't just get put away for 20 years or even for a lifetime. No. 
person says, wait a second. If I commit murder and I'm found guilty, death penalty? I have a feeling that people would think a little longer before they went out and did that. So here in verse 21, when Jesus says to the crowds, you have heard that the ancients were told. Oral tradition. You shall not commit murder. Yep, that's in the Old Testament. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to a human court? Uh-uh. That person is liable to God. Right? Not to, hey, Go hope you get that judge because he or she is kind of soft on murder. And you know what? You may only get five or ten years and you'll eventually parole and get out. Really? Uh-uh. So we see Jesus saying to the crowd, what you have heard about murder has been twisted. By oral tradition. That's why Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the ones who are twisting the scriptures, you're not getting to heaven. Now, some of you may say, well, phew, Andrew, that's okay. I've not committed murder with my hands. I'm, I'm, off the, I'm off the hook. Are you off the hook? Uh, we're about to see in verse 22. But before I get there, let me just again repeat uh, what I said last week. Can a murderer find forgiveness through Jesus Christ? Absolutely. If that murderer truly repents of his or her sins and truly trusts in Christ alone for salvation, of course a murderer can be forgiven. Can a person who has had an abortion be forgiven by Christ? Of course that person can. Jesus came to save sinners. We are all sinners. We're going to see that very clearly in verse 22. So yes, there's forgiveness in Christ. And yes, through Christ, your eternity is secure. But that doesn't mean that we automatically bypass earthly consequences for our sinful actions. And so, somebody truly trusts in Christ and is found to be a murderer? Of course Christ can forgive that sin in terms of that day of judgment. But does that mean that that murderer suddenly gets a get-out-of-jail-free card here on earth? No. There are consequences. That's why we want to be very careful that we make sure our hearts are clean daily so that our hands don't do something that we will regret. That's what Jesus is saying here in verse 22. Again, Back to verse 21, you've heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court, eh, liable to God. Verse 22, but I say to you, do you see the antithesis? In fact, as we learned last week of the six examples that Jesus gives in verses 21 through 48, he also gives six antitheses, contrast. You have heard, but I say to you. You have heard, but I say to you. And so we see the first example and the first antithesis here. Verse 22, underline some words, please. But I say to you. Yeah, I would probably underline that. You see the authority there? That everyone, I'd circle everyone, that everyone who is what? Angry. Yeah, I'd underline that word, which I know you've never been angry before. But anyways, Everyone who is angry with his brother. Now, in this context, he's not talking believer angry with another believer. In 1 John, John talks about that. Here he's talking about people in general. Because again, he's preaching the Sermon on the Mount. There's a large crowd there, right? Right? 
So Jesus is saying, "Who? oh, you guys, this murder, you think it's just the outward act with the hands. I say to you, whoever, everyone who is angry with his brother, whoever that may be, is what? Guilty, underline guilty, before the court. Whose court? Or let me ask this way. Uh, can a human judge tell if you're angry inside? Not usually. Who can tell every time you're angry inside? <laughs> God. <laughs> so, everyone who is angry is guilty before the bar of God. Ugh. Let's keep going. Because Jesus isn't done. And whoever, I would underline whoever, just like everyone, whoever, whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, I'd underline that, shall be guilty. You see guilty again? Second time. Before the Supreme Court. In this context, he's talking about the Sanhedrin, uh, the council of 70 religious leaders there in Israel who took care of spiritual issues and also issues when people broke God's law. And the Sanhedrin had the power to stone people to death. You can just read about that in Acts chapter 6 when they stoned Stephen to death. Whoa, is Jesus saying if I call someone good for nothing, that could be guilty to the point where I could actually have a <gasps> death penalty? In God's eyes. Should we keep going? We, got one, we have one more part here. Which again, I know doesn't apply. This, none of this applies to any of you guys, but just we're learning, right? Third part, whoever, you see whoever again, I'd underline that, says, you fool, underline that, we'll learn what that means, shall be, you see the G word, guilty, underline that, enough to go into the fiery hell. Oh boy. You have heard Jesus says, but I say to you. Remember we learned last week how the Pharisees and scribes narrowed God's commands? Hey, as long as we don't commit the outward act of murder, it doesn't matter how many people we're murdering inside of us. They narrow that command. Jesus here broadens it. But I say to you, in God's eyes, murder is not simply the outward act with your hands. It is the inward attitude of your heart. And Jesus says, everyone who is angry internally, and we're going to learn what that means, is guilty before God. Again, a human judge very often won't see our internal anger. But the true just judge, God Almighty, sees our hearts, knows our hearts. Jesus said, whoever, again, whoever, notice, not just picking out a couple people, whoever says, you good for nothing, we'll learn what that means, is also guilty in God's eyes. Third one, whoever says to someone, you fool, is guilty, Jesus said, of going into the fiery hell, fiery, pedos, pyros, pyromaniac, fiery hell, Gehenna, 
Oh! Imagine this shock. <laughs> they just reverberated through the crowd there, right? <laughs> I mean, they got they had to have been sitting there going, "Who can get to heaven?" Cuz we're all murderers even inside. Exactly, that's the point. We need Christ and forgiveness through him and him alone. Because again, the Pharisees and scribes narrowed the command. Hey, as long as we haven't committed the outward act, they completely ignored their inward attitude. And here Jesus broadens the command, gives the true meaning of the command, that it's not just outward what we do, it's inward what we think, what we feel, and then even what we say. Again, think of the shock. Jesus says, anger, insults, condemning a person. Jesus says, that's murder in God's eyes because that person's made in the image of God. And deserves a murderer's punishment. Oh. So now that I have you depressed, <laughs> um, can I depress you just a little bit more? <laughs> You're going, no. <laughs> um, can I, I? You guys understand this part. Everyone, right? Guilty. You get that part, right? Whoever, guilty. Not hard to understand. Again, whoever, guilty. Not under, hard to understand. But can I teach you a little bit of Greek when it comes to these three words? Angry, good for nothing, you fool. Let's, let, let's really say, let's really try to understand what these words mean as Jesus clarifies the command. Angry. The Greek word, orgizomenos. It actually comes from orgi. Zomenos, the, the tense here, means it's continual. Continuous. Orgi, orgizomenos, means to be bitter. It is a bitter Simmering, vengeful anger. Now again, the Bible obviously makes it clear that all anger is not wrong. There is what's called righteous anger. Uh, when Jesus cleansed the temple because of what the religious leaders did, they turned it you know, into a, a den of thieves, Jesus said. Was Jesus' anger righteous? Yes. The Bible talks about, in Psalm 7, how God is angry with the wicked every day. Is that sinful anger of God or righteous anger? It's righteous. Question. Orgizomenos. Is that righteous or unrighteous anger? When you're bitter and your anger is simmering and it's vengeful. It's not righteous. And don't try to justify it. Because I'll tell you something. In marriage, we try to do that all the time. Right? It's not my fault. It's hers. She deserves my anger. No, 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 no. You understand what Jesus meant? Everyone who's angry, like this, is guilty. Why? Because it's heart murder. But then Jesus said, whoever says to his brother, 
you good for nothing. Greek word, raka. Uh, we don't actually have like a, a modern, a perfect modern day equivalent. I, I've read some commentaries where they uh, translate raka. Uh, you're saying to somebody, you empty headed fool. Uh, raka is disdain, contempt. You've got this anger that's simmering inside of you. Now, it turns to contempt for a person's head and intelligent. Intelligent. You empty-headed fool. Which again, I know none of you have ever said to somebody or thought about that about somebody, right? <laughs> Your face is betraying you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, imagine the crowd going, oh, right? Just like you're looking at me right now. So we understand angry, organizomenos. We understand you good for nothing, raka. But look what else Jesus says. And whoever says, you fool, you fool, more. Uh, we get our English word moron, moronic. More, again, it's a contempt, but it's even worse than just calling somebody empty headed. You've already passed judgment on that person's character. What you're basically saying when you, more, you fool, uh, you godless, graceless, worthless. Fool who deserves hell. And again, I know none of you have ever said that or thought that about anybody, right? As though we are the true judge of somebody's eternal destiny. A person who commits the outward act of murder is basically saying, you are worthless. And therefore, I'm taking your life. But when you say, more to somebody, you're pretty much saying the same thing in your heart and with your mouth, you're worthless. And I wish you were dead and burning in hell. Oy. So notice the downward spiral. It starts with organizomenos. You've got that simmering bitterness. vengeful anger just rumbling inside of you. No one sees it. No one knows it. You can either ignore it or even justify or rationalize it. You can coddle it and play around with it. What's it going to hurt? I haven't committed the outward act yet. And as it continues to simmer, it turns to contempt. Raka. You idiot. You non-intelligent fool. You deserve my anger. You deserve my hatred because you're such an idiot. But then it descends even further. It is contempt, not just for a person's head and intelligence or lack thereof. It's contempt for a person's heart and character. 
More, I wish you were dead. You deserve to burn in hell. You see where it goes? And oh, by the way, what do you think the next step is after this? The outward act. Murder does not originate with the hands. It originates in the heart. And if we don't get this part here cleaned up, by the way, based on your, all of your faces now, I think you all are going, oh, I have been guilty of this, or maybe I am currently guilty of this. Friends, if we don't get this cleaned up on a daily basis by the power of God through the grace of Christ and through the transforming, sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, guys, if we are not working on these hearts, think of that bitterness that just resides in us, that poison. And that's why Jesus is saying here, Oh, you've heard, but I say to you. If that poison is not taken care of, chances are eventually it's coming out. And again, the Pharisees and scribes are saying, hey, we're okay because nothing has come out. All the while, while they are playing around with this inside of them, and Jesus says, ah, 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 ah. The true judge, the divine judge, does not only see our outward acts, he sees our inward attitude. It's interesting. I can be a model law-abiding citizen. As an adult, never got in a fist fight with anybody out on the streets. Yet look what's going on inside of me. And Jesus says, in God's eyes, The crime of murder deserves the punishment. That God has declared about murder. And oh, by the way, notice Jesus doesn't say, well, um, <laughs> just because you're afraid to do the act, <laughs> <laughs> or haven't had the opportunity to do the act, doesn't get us off the hook. Because God sees what's inside. Hop over to Matthew 15. You guys understand the Greek here? Matthew 15. Starting in verse 1, Then some Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Do you see it? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Watch, watch, watch. They're trying to give Jesus grief because his disciples didn't wash their hands before they ate. All the while, look what's going on in their hearts. So Jesus answered verse 3 and said to them, Why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? And Jesus gives an example, verse 4. For God said, Yes, in the Old Testament it is written, Honor your father and mother. 
And he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to what? Oh, remember that, Michaela? But you say, you Pharisees and scribes say, well, whoever says to his mother or father, what I have to help you, you know, now you're elderly and I've got some money set aside and I know I'm supposed to help you, but you know what, mom and dad, I can't help you. Why? Because I have committed this money to God. Notice they committed, didn't yet give it. <laughs> Sorry, mom and dad, can't help you. I have to hold this because I committed it to God. You think they're going to eventually give it to the, uh, to, the, to the work of God? No. Jesus says, you're not honoring your father and mother. And look what Jesus says. By this you invalidate the word of God for the sake of your tradition. Arefe. You hypocrites. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. After Jesus called the crowd to him, called the crowd to him he said to them, Hear and understand. It's not what enters into the mouth that defiles a man. Yes, we believe in hygiene, but look, if you don't wash your hands before you eat, you know, come on. That's not the reason you're defiled on the inside. It's not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth. This defiles a man. Would you guys agree with that? Well, then the disciples came to Jesus and said, I love this. Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this statement? <laughs> Imagine our Lord going, really? Like I care. <laughs> that's not written in Scripture. That's kind of my commentary on that. Actually, that's what I would say. <laughs> okay? Well, they were offended. And Jesus answered, Every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be uprooted. Let them alone. They're blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Peter said to him, verse 15, explain the parable to us. Jesus said, are you still lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and it's eliminated? Michaela, thumbs up on that. You're studying medicine. Is that correct? Verse 18. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from where? The heart. Michaela, thumbs up on that one. And those defile the man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, False witnesses, slander, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands is not defile the man. Do you see what Jesus was saying back in Matthew 5? Heart murder in God's eyes? guilty because again think about this downward spiral eventually if this is not handled this which is in our hearts it's coming out maybe our hands our mouths in fact just hop over to James 3 James, half-brother of Jesus, verse 1, chapter 3 says, not let, men, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. Why? Because our tongues sometimes say things, ugh. Cresho, let me see your face when it comes to that verse. We live under that fear every day, don't we? For we all, verse 2, 
stumble in many ways when it comes to our speaking, right? And then he kind of says something sarcastic. Well, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, I guess he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Um, is that possible, to never stumble with your words? That's why, again, as a pastor, I have to. I just want to preach the Word, nothing but the Word, and absolutely everything in the Word. I don't want to ever step outside and give my opinions because I have to give an account for every word I teach. And you know what? It's a lot safer to stay right within the bounds of Scripture. And then look what James says. He's about to talk about the tongue a little bit here. And he uses some examples. He says, look, if we put the bits, which is a small thing, into the horse's mouth so they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. You think about that. A small little bit can control a huge animal. Verse 4, look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, yet they're still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. Here's his point, verse 5. So also, you know, the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire, by such a small tongue. The tongue is a fire. The very world of iniquity. You know, raka, more. And sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. Is that a true statement? It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse men. Raka, more. Oh, by the way, we curse men. Finish the sentence. Who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing. I praise you, God. And cursing. God, send that person to hell. My brethren, James says, these things ought not to be this way. You agree? Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? No. Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives? No. Or vine produce figs? No. Nor can salt water produce fresh water. In other words, what James is saying is, guys, what are you doing? Small little part of our body, the tongue. Watch this. Combined with simmering, vengeful, bitter anger in our hearts. You put that combination together. Oh, boy. Back to Matthew 5 as I conclude. Verse 20, Jesus said to the crowds, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. For example, number one, you've heard that the ancients were told at Ephe, you shall not commit murder. Yes, that's a command. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to, well, whatever mood the court is in. Uh-uh. Verse 22, Jesus says, let's just remove all the hypocrisy. But I say to you that everyone who is orgizomenos, 
with his brother, whoever that may be, shall be guilty before the bar of God who sees that orgasmos in us. And whoever says to his brother, you know that small little tongue? Raka! I have contempt, disdain for your head and your intelligence and lack thereof. Jesus says, um, you shall also be guilty. For the Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin, who has the power to stone you to death, if they follow God's word, which leads us to believe that God even considers words like that, insults like that, contempt like that, deserving of death penalty. And whoever says, more, you empty, you, 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 you godless, worthless person deserving of hell, you shall be guilty enough yourself to go into the fiery hell. Do you guys understand what Jesus was saying here? And though I joked several times earlier saying, oh, I know this doesn't apply to you. <laughs> I see that you understand that this applies to all of us. Don't get caught in the trap that the Pharisees and the scribes are where they narrowed this command. We're okay, as long as we don't do the outward act. And they completely ignored their inward attitude. Jesus said, let me straighten everybody out. Here's the true meaning of the sixth commandment. You shall not murder. You shall not do it outwardly with your hands, and you shall not do it inwardly with your heart. Outward guilty before God, inward guilty before God. Guys, hand murder always starts with heart murder. So we've got to get the hearts right, wouldn't you agree? Remember as we started the service earlier, we read Psalm 103 where the psalmist was praising God for not treating us as our sins deserve. <laughs> Whoa. Remember in Psalm 103 where the psalmist was saying, God, you are slow to anger. You are abounding in loving kindness. God, you are merciful. Remember the psalmist said that just as a father disciplines his son whom he loves, God also disciplines those whom he loves. Christian, take this as God's loving discipline that we all need, right? Because it's so easy to let that stuff simmer and to play around with it. Thinking, wow, we haven't done anything outwardly. We, let's play around with it. Guys, it's the worst thing. Let me tell you, in marriage, oh, talk about Forest fires that could be prevented <laughs> if each person in marriage just says, whoa, it's not about her, it's not about him, it's about me. And as I close, I want you to just think of this. Christian, first of all, do you see why? No matter how good you try to make yourself through your own efforts, do you see why? Jesus said, and I continue to teach, you cannot earn your salvation through your own efforts. I mean, just look at us inside, <laughs> right? Right? 
Think about God's love and mercy for you, Christian. Did, did God, before the foundation of time, when he chose you, when the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit chose you before the foundation of time, did God know about this, that this was going to be in you? Yeah. And yet he still chose you? How about this one? 2,000 years ago, Christ on the cross. You know, Christ. God the Son, the second person of the Trinity who came to this earth 2,000 years ago. Jesus, the perfect God-man, truly God, truly man. Perfectly fulfilling all righteousness for us. When he got angry, it was righteous anger. He never sinned once. And then he went to the cross. Why? For sinners like us. You know, the model law-abiding citizens who aren't like, you know, those criminals in jail? Ugh! And Jesus hung on that cross and God the Father and His love for us, rather than punishing us with the punishment we deserve, our sins were placed on Jesus. By the way, did Jesus know about these sins? And yet he willingly substituted himself in our place on that cross so that we wouldn't have to face God's just wrath for our sins. Christ in our place was punished with the wrath that we deserve. He never did this once. We do this all the time. Jesus died for us, but three days later, he rose in victory. What does that mean? That means that he paid for your sins in full in terms of that day of judgment. And if you haven't yet truly trusted in Christ and who he is, what he's done for you, if you haven't repented of your sins, including these, and if you haven't cried out to him and saying, Jesus, please be merciful to me, woe the sinner, then what are you waiting for? You're going to try to get to heaven and be right before God, accepted by God, based upon your righteousness? Eh. Because God doesn't just see the outward acts or the ones we, that we think we're okay because we didn't commit. No, God looks at the inward attitude and is everybody in 100% agreement? We are murdering all day long. And so that's why we need Christ's righteousness for forgiveness of sins in terms of the day of judgment. But even as Christians, I wish we could say, hey, once Jesus saved me, eh, let's just X this out. This has nothing to do with me. Wouldn't you agree that since God the Holy Spirit, Christian, has regenerated you, made you alive, where you now understand truth, wouldn't you agree that you notice this more and more inside of you? <laughs> and you go, oh, what a sinner I am, yes. And guess what? What an incredible Savior you have who is compassionate, who is merciful, who is so patient with us. Not that he wants us to continue to stay in sin. Not that he wants us to play around with this. But he, he will, if you come to him in true repentance, if you are open and transparent with him, he will forgive you, Christian. Again, you're already forgiven in terms of that day of judgment. Praise God. But he will forgive you now. And guys, look. Don't, don't, don't try to hide away and say, well, that's just not me, or I'm not so bad. We all are. You know, people always talk to me. Uh, Crusher, we, were, we did a podcast last week on this. And, oh, Andrew, you know, here you, 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 you are always out praying early in the morning. You're doing your Bible study. And listen, guys, don't praise me because of that. You know why I do that so diligently every day and so long every day? Because look what's inside of me every day. Man, in order for me to be able to come and preach to you and not be a hypocrite, 
You know what has to be cleansed out of me constantly and only by God's grace. And so, admit, yeah, that's you. And maybe you need to call out to Christ for salvation because that's you. And those who have already been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, that's still us. I mean, we don't, we, 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 we don't want to contaminate these hearts and then all of a sudden our minds and our words and our actions. We want to live lives that bring glory to Christ, the one who did this for us. And what's so incredible is his continued mercy, his grace, wherever you are right now. Spend some time with your Lord. Before we close in praise and worship, have a conversation with your Lord. You know where you are right now. And praise Him for who He is and how He is. Amen.